want to minister a text from John chapter 3 tonight. John chapter 3, verses 14 and 15. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Jesus often spoke in likenesses and figures. He would liken the kingdom unto a net that drew in many fish, or liken the kingdom unto a merchant man seeking goodly pearls, or in different ways he would speak in likenesses. There are times also when Jesus would draw from accounts of real happenings in the scripture, especially among the people of Israel, and make an interpretation of those things because these likenesses were depictions of real spiritual realities that are associated with salvation. And that's what we have here. This is actually Jesus' commentary on something that happened in Israel when they were making their way down, the spies were making toward Canaan, and they ran into uh, the king, uh, Arad, said that he was a Canaanite, and in the altercation, that king took some of the people of Israel prisoner. Well, Israel had made a vow to God that if he would, if he would give this king into their hands, then they would destroy all the cities which is what they did. We get the idea that upon that, the finishing of that battle, they were making their way from Mount Hor down into the land of Edom. And the scripture says that they were discouraged, much discouraged because of the way. Discouragement at this time, we learn, can be, can be very, it can make a person very vulnerable to the wrong kind of thinking, as it did with them. And because of their discouragement, they began to murmur. The scripture says that the people spake against God and against Moses. It seems insane, but that is exactly what happened. You remember what they said. You brought us out into the wilderness to kill us. And here we are in the wilderness where there's no bread and there's no water, and we loathe this light bread. It's astounding, but that is exactly what they did. And so God responds will change the diet. God sent fiery serpents in among the people, and those serpents began to bite the people, and the scripture says that much people died. Well, upon this, the Israelites realized without even God having to tell them what the sins were, they themselves knew what they had done, what was wrong, and they confessed those things. That we murmured against the Lord and murmured against Moses, and they asked for Moses to pray so that the Lord would take away the serpents. And the Lord did, in fact, make a provision. He told Moses to make a serpent, a bronze serpent, and to hoist it up on a pole. And he said, It shall come to pass that everyone that is bitten, when he looketh upon it, shall live. And that's exactly what happened. Yeah. And so what we have in John chapter 3, verse 14 and 15, is Jesus' interpretation of those events. Okay? Now, there are a couple of things that I want to see here that I think will help to, to give meaning to this marvelous Savior that we have, which is Jesus, which is what I want to do. Um, that's obviously what God has done. He's the one who has exalted him. And, and this meditation, I thought, you know, this becomes a time for us to just see Jesus as God sees him in this exalted place. And so I hope these thoughts will help us to, to, to better appreciate the kind of Savior that we have. First, we see in this account the indignation of God towards sin and sinners. God's response to their sin is fiery serpents. The scripture says that much people died. Now, much people in this room would not really amount to a whole lot, but much people in the nation of Israel amounts to a whole lot. We're talking about a lot of people. You can imagine a lot of people being bitten and just dying and falling on the ground in their midst. I don't know how many it was, but it was a lot. A lot of people. Now, I know that there are people that would say that this is not how God responds to sinners. Like a lot of contemporary pe preaching would deny the fact that God would do something like this at all. But we already have God's word on this. I have created the destroyer to destroy. That's, right. yes. That's our God. A fiery serpent is a venomous snake. I don't know exactly what the snake might have been in that day. Uh, I don't know. 
But I know there are comparable snakes in our day, and a, a venomous snake is a remarkable killer. Remember, God's the one who made it. For example, I looked online and kind of looked at some, some equivalent snakes that were venomous snakes today that are extremely poisonous. In Africa, they have what is called a black mama. Maybe you've heard something about it. The black mama is an amazing killer. Although it is a defensive snake, but at the same time, it is one of the most aggressive snakes that there is. A black mama can jump into a speed of about six miles an hour, which is faster than any man can go from a stop and to run away from that snake. So if you're anywhere close to it, there's no way you can get away. That's how fast it is. A black mama can raise up one third of its body into the air and run like that. And a black mamba, if it does strike a man, it does have the potential to kill a man in 10 minutes, or as many as maybe like four hours. But the point is, you can't go home and wake up the next day and go to the emergency room to take care of it. That's how venomous it is. It's, it's amazing. I didn't look up all snakes. I didn't want this to become a distraction, but just, just to get the idea of what God created these snakes. He created these snakes, and he used them here to destroy a king cobra by one gram of venom, which is the equivalent of 0.2 of a teaspoon, can kill 150 people. There is a snake known that by the venom which it has in its own body can kill 150,000 people. God creates a destroyer, and he can use it to destroy. You see, God is making a point here, as we see in this text. God cannot look at sin and not respond with wrath to it. Habakkuk chapter 1 and verse 13, Thou art of purer eyes than to behold evil and canst not look on iniquity. If God looks on sin, he has to deal with it. And is always met with divine indignation that is the way it is god judgeth the righteous and god is angry with the wicked every day if he turn not if he turn not i'm going to get just a little bit to the turning but if he doesn't turn he will wet his sword he hath bent his bow and made it ready he also he hath also prepared for him that is for the one that doesn't turn instruments of death that's the way God wants to be known. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There are men that deny this today, uh -huh. but they should not. Just the mere name of places and persons shows us just how serious sin is if men do not turn from it, like Cain yeah. and Esau mm -hmm. and Sodom and Gomorrah right. and Pharaoh mm -hmm. and Achan yeah. and Judas. God demonstrated his hatred towards sin in the lives of real people. Amen. And that's what he did here in this account. See, under no uncertain circumstances is a person safe who is in sin. And that, that's one thing that I hate about the unconditional love gospel is yeah. because it gives people the notion, the idea that somehow sin isn't really that bad. Uh -huh. And God will love you regardless. Mm -hmm. Never speak in such a way as to give someone the notion that is in sin that he is safe while he is in sin. Yeah, yeah. Because now you are in conflict with this account. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Why say things like this? Because if men do not take sin seriously, they will place no value on a savior from sin. And if you diminish the seriousness of sin in the mind of people, you diminish the value of Christ's work in taking it away. Amen. That's why this record is in the Bible. If you look at this record rightly, it'll make you very thankful yes. for Jesus Christ. Amen. Very, very thankful for Jesus Christ. Throughout the scriptures, the message always is, sin not. Moses said it himself, God has come to prove you and that his fear may be before your faces that you sin not. The beloved psalmist David said this, I said I will take heed to my ways that I sin 
not yeah. with my tongue. Uh -huh. Jesus said to that adulterous woman that he was so merciful to, you remember the mercy that he had toward her, where are your condemners? Mm -hmm. And she said, there is none that condemns me. And he said, neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. Amen. Paul said, awake to righteousness and sin not. And when John wrote the first John, he said, my little children, these things write I unto you that you sin not. We never want to send this message to people that they are safe while in sin. When these events took place and the serpents began to bite the people, God had actually put this people exactly where he wanted them to be. He wanted them to understand that there is no way to save yourselves from sin and death. Uh -huh. And so he hemmed them in with this account right here. Mm -hmm. There was no way that they could save themselves. Mm -hmm. To me, that's the marvelous thing to behold in Moses being the one to raise the serpent up. Yeah. Uh -huh. You see, before a person will appreciate the gospel message, they've got to have like a pre-work before the gospel. And it is the law of Moses, yeah. the very thing that convinces men of sin. Because before they will actually turn to the Savior, they have got to first be convinced that there is no other way to yeah. be saved. Amen. And that's the work of the law. See, it cuts down all other saviors that aren't really saviors. And that's what is done for us. See, a man will cry out to God when he finally realizes that there's no other way. No other way but God, and that was the occasion here. There was no other way to be saved than to cry out to God, which is exactly what they did. So now what does God do? When a man knows he is a sinner and he can't do anything about his condition, he is dying and he's ultimately going to perish. There is mercy with God that he may be feared. This is an astounding show of mercy here that the one who was offended is the one who came up with a remedy mm -hmm. for the wrath that was being poured out right. on those who had offended him. Mm -hmm. But that is exactly what happened here. Mm -hmm. God didn't say, go your way. Find your own way of, of, of you know, getting a remedy for it. He didn't say that at all. Mm -hmm. God provided the instruction. God told Moses what to do, and you know like I know, there isn't any some magical, mystical power in a bronze serpent, uh -huh. and in looking to it, yeah. God was the one showing mercy yes. Amen. and providing healing yes. for these people upon their confession. It is the Lord's mercy that we are not consumed because his compassions fail not. See, every one of us have been part of this snake-bitten sin-ridden race, yeah, Adam's race, and that's what it is. It's a race dominated by sin and death. We've all been there. How do you explain that you weren't consumed? Because God's merciful. Amen. And his compassions fail not, although they were tempted by sin here, but they didn't fail. And God provided this remedy yeah. for them. Now, the way he provided it brings us to Christ that he lifted this bronze serpent up on a pole and whoever looked at that bronze serpent was made whole. Now, let me just say something real quick about sin because it works like venom works. Sin like venom has an external manifestation but it has long since been an internal problem before it manifests itself externally. That's the way venom works, see? It had, does its work on the inside before it manifests itself on the outside. By the time you see the red streaks running up the arms, you're already in deep trouble. Before it, once, once sin has reached expression, it's already done the damage. It's an astounding thing that when men go to deal and address sin in the lives of people, that they just deal with it topically. Yeah. And they think if we'll just stop the expression of sin, then now, now we've cured the problem. But we haven't cured the problem, have yeah. we? Yeah. Because venom works from the inside out, yeah. and yeah. so does sin. That's right. That's right. Their throat is an open That's sepulcher, right? right? 
It's death working from the inside out. And I'll tell you, this is what makes Jesus such a marvelous Savior. Because the best men can do is change the outside of man. The best they can be on their own is whited sepulchers. But now we're seeing Jesus raised up and elevated in a place where only he can work. Jesus is the only one who can save men from the inside out. He's a marvelous Savior. Sin is not a topical problem, and Jesus is not a superficial Savior. You can imagine going into a clinic after having been bitten by one of these venomous snakes and the doctor saying to you, well, no problem. It's only two small holes, so here's what we're going to do. I'm just going to pour some alcohol on that, put a Band-Aid on that. You'll be out of here in five minutes. But that is how men treat sin, isn't it? That isn't how the Savior treats sin. He doesn't treat sin topically because sin has done its damage on the inside before it makes it to the outside. You see, Jesus specializes in giving life to those dead in sin. When God began with Adam, he started with nothing, formed him from the ground, and breathed life into him. But when Jesus starts with men, he starts with sinners that are dead in trespasses and sins. That is, he has been given power to make men alive who are dead. It's regenerative power, and it has been given to him by God. As Jesus said, for as the Father raiseth up the dead and quickeneth them, even so the Son quickeneth whom he will. And wherever sin has reached, Jesus' work in saving us and giving us life has in fact reached that far. It's a marvelous work. He's washed us from our sins in his own blood. He's purged our consciences from dead works. He's purified our hearts by faith and circumcised our hearts. All these are inside works. These are inside things. Where sin touched, he's reached. He's purified unto himself a peculiar people and renewed a right spirit in us. And all these other things that he's done, he's done on the inside. But how has he done it? How do you benefit from something like that? By looking. By looking. This is God's message to sinful people who know that they cannot Stop sinning, nor take care of the problem of iniquity. He says to them, look to me. Look to me. Look unto me, and be ye saved, all the ends of the earth. For I am God, and there is none else. And when a, when a man can realize, really, that there is none else, he's prepared to look like a man needs to look to God to be saved. You see, the looking here is a specific kind of looking. It's a looking of faith. It's a looking of believing. It's a looking of trusting. When they looked to that serpent, they were trusting that the word of God would be true, that if they looked to it, they would, in fact, live. And that is exactly what happened. The scripture says, those who believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. That's looking. It is the looking of faith. So I want to encourage you about this, brother, and this... This is a marvelous, marvelous truth. I, I, I've done no justice to it at all, but, but this, this is the truth of what's happened. God demonstrated way back here in Israel, and we're seeing it now in people who have all sinned, fallen short of the glory of God, could do nothing about what they've done, and yet now they're being changed from the inside out. Why? Because they've looked to this Savior. And so I encourage you tonight as we, as we uh, come to this table to, to take a, a fresh look to him. And brother, let me just say this before I pray. As long as there's any kind of sin or death about us, there is still only one solution to be saved from that influence. And it's not looking to me, and it's not looking to everyone around you. It's looking to the only one who's been raised up to give life, and that's the Son of God. Father, we thank you so much for this truth, and we just pray that you would bless our remembrance of Christ. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.